This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Number six. Look at the requirement first. Otherwise, I, said, I think I said before, you end up wasting time. For these items, what total figures should be included in the company's statement of financial position? As of 31st December, 20x5. And you've got those various choices. You want the totals for current assets, current liabilities. Well, let's go back and read it. At December X5, the following require inclusion in the financial statements. And there are three things. So let's run through each in turn. First of all, number one. On the 1st of January, the company made a loan of 12000 to an employee repayable on 1st of January 2006. Well, before I read the rest of it, surely if we've made a loan, there's money owed to the company? It's going to be repaid on the 1st of January X6. We're doing the accounts at December X5. And so we are owed that 12,000. It's a current asset. It's not, rep uh, it's not paid to us till tomorrow. However, there's a bit more there. It says we're charging interest at 2% a year. On the due date, which is 1st of January tomorrow, on the due date, she repaid the loan and the whole of the interest due on the loan. So as that 31st December, we've not received any interest and so we're owed money. And how much interest are we owed? The employee borrowed the money on 1st of January, so they've had the loan all year. The interest is 2% for the year. In 2% of 12,000 is how much? Uh, 240. I won't bother adding up yet, we have two other things to look at. But at the end of December, we're owed the full amount of the loan plus a year's interest. What about number two? The company paid an annual insurance premium of 9,000 in 2065, covering the year ending 31st of August 2066. Well, we're doing the accounts at the end of December X5. We've already paid all the way through to August, so we've overpaid, we've prepaid insurance. And how much have we uh, prepaid? Well, we've, uh, we're doing uh, December X5. We've paid up to the end of August X6. So we've overpaid January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August. Eight months. Uh, the insurance, it was annual, it was for 12 months. So we've overpaid eight twelfths of the 9,000. which is 6,000. And if we've overpaid, we're owed the money back, a prepayment, it's a current asset. Unfortunately, we're still not there yet, so number three. In January X6, which is next year, remember our year ends December X5, in January X6, we received rent from a tenant of 4,000 covering the six months to December. So we received rent. We didn't receive it until uh, January, but we'd earned the money during the six months to December. So it was income of our year. And at the end of December, we must have been owed the rent. There was rent owing to us. At the end of December, we were owed 4,000. Uh, and if you sold to us, a receivable, a current asset. So in fact, they're all current assets. And the total we're owed 
is 240, 12, 18, 22, 240. So current assets 22, 240. There were no current liabilities. And so the answer is B. And I said earlier, although I'm trying to write reasonably neatly so you can follow me, for heaven's sake in the exam, something like this, you'll need to do some workings, but don't waste time being neat or being pretty. Uh, as I said, nobody will look at the workings. All they'll look at is the final answer. Uh, it's right or it's wrong. Number seven. What would the net profit be after adjusting for this error? Let's go back and read it. A company's statement of profit or loss for the year showed a net profit of 83,600. It was later found that 18,000 paid for the purchase of a motor van had been debited to motor expenses. And our policy is to depreciate motor vans, 25% straight line with a full year's charge in the year of acquisition. All right, well, why is that 83,600 wrong? Uh, firstly, I hope most obviously, we bought a van for 18,000. And if we buy a van, credit cash, we should debit the van account. It's an asset. It doesn't affect our um, profit statement. But by mistake, we've debited motor expenses. And of course, motor expenses, that would have reduced the profit. So we've had an expense of 18,000, which we shouldn't have had. So we'll have to add back that error. If we hadn't have had the expense, the profit would have been higher. However, although that's the main error, there is that other problem, of course, uh, that that 18,000 should have been shown on the uh, statement of financial position as an asset. But of course, if we've got an asset, we should be depreciating. And it says it's 25% straight line, full years in the year of acquisition. And so if we haven't, had the, if we haven't recorded the fact we've got a van, we won't have recorded depreciation and we should have done. And so there is an extra expense for depreciation. And how much is it? 25% straight line, so on cost of 18,000. And a full year's charge in the year of purchase. So 25% of 18,000 is 4,500. And so what's the correct profit? Uh, 83,600. Add back the 18, subtract the 4.5, I get 97,100. The answer is C. So a nice one. And again, the real problem with these, I do warn you, is time pressure. When you're practicing at home, do do them under time pressure. Because a question like that one, uh, quite honestly, if you were given half an hour, I think everybody would get it right. When you're trying to do it in um, just a couple of minutes, that's when, however good you are, there's that danger of misreading something or, or making a silly mistake. So, you know, when you're practising, first time round, take as long as you like, make sure you can do them. But do go back and practise under time pressure and get used to working at speed. Uh, and trying to avoid misreading and silly mistakes. Anyway, which one are we up to? Number eight. Which of the following statements is correct? And there's various ratios here. And if we look back, um, Gazina, or however you pronounce it, has the following working capital ratios, 2069 and the previous year, 2068. Current ratio, receivables, days, payable, days, and interest, turnover. Well, uh, no choice here but to go through each in turn and think about them. A. Zena's liquidity and working capital has improved in X9. 
Well, the most basic measure of liquidity is the current ratio. Uh, the current assets divided by current liabilities. And the bigger that is, the more certain we can pay our bills. The lower it is, the more worried we are. Uh, and that measures liquidity. How easy it is to pay our bills. Well, in fact, I can say straight away, look. Uh, last year in X8, uh, the current assets were one and a half times our current liabilities. This year, they're only 1.2 times. And so surely the liquidity, the ability to pay bills has fallen. It's gone worse. It's not improved. So it's not A. B. Zena is receiving cash from customers more quickly this year than last year. Well, the measure of how quickly customers pay is receivables days. This year, they're taking, it seems, on average 75 days to pay. Last year, it was only 50 days. So we're not receiving cash more quickly. They're taking a lot longer. B. It's not B. Uh, C. Well, actually, I've already answered this. Zena is suffering from a worsening liquidity position. Yes, we said that when we looked at A. The current ratio last year was uh, assets were one and a half times current liabilities. This year, current assets only 1.2 times. Liquidity is going worse. The answer is C. Uh, finally, D, if you're confident in C, don't waste time. Otherwise, D. Zena is taking longer to pay suppliers this year than last year. Well, that's payable days. Last year we were taking on average 45 days to pay suppliers. This year it's only 30 days. So in fact, we're paying them faster. We're certainly not taking longer. So the answer is C. No problem. Number nine. Which of the following statements is are correct? I don't know. Some people find these easy, some hard. A lot depends on um, how fast you can read. And I appreciate if English is your second, third language, it takes a lot longer. If it's taking a long time to read, jump over it, like I said. And Come back later if you have time. However, let's read them, which are correct. Number one, a statement of cash flows prepared using the direct method produces a different figure to net cash from operating activities from that produced if the indirect method is used. No. Direct, indirect, two different ways of setting it out, of getting the figure, but they both end up giving the same figure, they must. Two, rights issues of shares do not feature, do not appear in a statement of cash flows. Wrong. A rights issue, whatever you remember or don't remember about them, it is an issue of shares for cash. And if you've received cash, it must appear on the um, statement of cash flows. Three, a surplus on revaluation of a non-current asset will not appear as an item on the statement of cash flows. That's true. Revaluation, revaluing an asset, you've not actually received or paid, for that matter, any cash. If you've not received or paid any cash, you've just changed a value. Well, it's only cash flows appear on the statement. Now, finally, number four. A profit on the sale of a non-current asset will appear as an item under cash flows from investing activities. No. Well, some people get very confused. It's when we're working out the cash flows from operating activities. We have to adjust the profit by any profit or loss on sale of non-current assets to get that cash flow. However, that was only an adjustment under the heading cash flows from investing activities. 
what we show is the cash received from sale of non-current assets, not the profit. The profit itself isn't a cash flow. Number 10. What amount of rental income should appear in the company's statement of profit or loss for the year ended 30th of April? So the rental income is what we're after. And what does it say? A company receives rent from a large number of prof properties. The total received in the year to April X6 was 481.200. So the cash we've received, 481.200. However, why is that not our income for the statement of uh, profit or loss? It's because you've given below the following were the amounts of rent in advance and in arrears at 30 of April X5, the beginning of the year, and 30 of April X6, the end of the year. Now, again, how you do your workings is your choice. Some people prefer to write up a tier count. If you do, that's fine. Uh, I actually prefer not to, but I'm not going to argue. It's whichever you found easier and faster. What I do is this. I say, that's the cash we've received during the year. However, if you look at the table, it says at the end of last year, beginning of this year, we'd already received some rent in advance, 28700 so we'd already had the cash last year. It's not included in the 481. But because it was received in advance, it is income for this year. So to get our income for this year, we need to add, well, I'm going to write it the other way around. At the start of the year, I need to add the rent in advance. Of 28700 because again it's not included in the 481 we have the cash last year but it's this year's income however also at the start of the year end of last year there was rent in arrears that means there was rent from last year that was owing to us and we'll have had the cash this year included in that 481 um, is rent that was owing to us from last year. It was last year's income, not this year's. So less rent in arrears. Uh, I won't um, add up yet because we're not finished. However, what about the end of the year? At the end of this year, we've received rent in advance. So it means that during this year, that 481 includes 31,200 cash we've received, which was in advance. It's next year's income, not this year's. So we need to take off that rent in advance of 31,200. And finally, at the end of this year, uh, there's rent in arrears. At the end of this year, we're owed 18400 We're owed it. It's this year's rent, but we haven't had the cash. It's not in the 481, but it is this year's income. So add the rent that's owing to us, the rent in arrears. And so after adding and subtracting, what is the actual income for this year? 481,200 plus uh, 28,700 minus 21,200 minus 31,200 plus 18,400. Um, 475,900, which is one of my choices, it's answer D. So it's up to you. As I said, I find it easier that way. It's, again, it's taken me a while, but it's because I'm talking through it and writing it in full. If you find it easier with a tear count, no problem.
Uh, I say again, it's whatever you find easiest and quickest. Uh, I can't think of any other way of doing it, that or a tea account, but that's up to you. Let's carry on with number 11. Another statement one. Which of the, fo which of the following are differences between sole traders and limited liability companies? The wording's quite clever here, so be very careful as you're reading it. Number one, a sole trader's financial statements are private and never made available to third parties, to other people. A company's financial statements are sent to shareholders and may be publicly filed. But a quick glance, that looks true, but be careful. A sole trader's financial statements are private, that's true, and never made available to third parties. Well, that's not true. Uh, you don't have to make them available to third parties, but you may do. For instance, if I'm a sole trader and I need to borrow money from the bank, I'm quite likely to show my statements to the bank. We can't say they're never made available. Also, a company's financial statements are sent to shareholders, that's true, and may be publicly filed. Well, they must be publicly filed. So, as I say, it's almost true. It's, in some ways, a tiny bit unfair. But it's the use of the words never made available and may be filed, which make it wrong. Number two, only companies have share capital. True. Sole traders don't. Number three, a sole trader is fully and personally liable for any losses that the business might make. Yes. Can't repeat the lectures, go back and watch them if you haven't. Uh, but that's a, a, a desperately important feature of a sole trader. Number four, drawings would only appear in the financial statements of a sole trader. Yes. The owners may get money a limited company, it's dividends, and it works rather differently. Uh, but drawings only occur for a sole trader. So it's two, three, or four. The answer is B. Number 12, yet another statement one. Which of the following statements is true? A, the interpretation of an entity's financial statements using ratios is only useful for potential investors? No. Investors uh, might use ratios, but they're certainly not the only people. In fact, more important than anything uh, is for the managers. The managers of the business are very likely to um, want to use ratios. B. Ratios based on historical data, on past data, can predict the future performance. No, not at all. Whether I did well or badly last year, that doesn't tell me whether I'll do well or badly next year. Not at all. C, the analysis of financial statements using ratios provides useful information when compared with previous performance or industry averages, yes. Ratios on their own don't mean an awful lot. It's when you compare that, you know, we, we, the ratio's better or worse than last year. Or our ratios are better or worse than similar companies. It's only when we compare um, that they really tell us anything. D. An entity's management will not assess an entity's performance using financial ratios. Well, that's rubbish. Uh, they might measure performance using all sorts of different things. But certainly, one thing they're likely to look at are financial ratios. Thirteen. Ah, a numbers one. A company's motor vehicles cost account uh, at 30 June at 6 is as follows. Now, I always think this is a very silly little question, but still. What, oh, sorry, that's at 30th of June, X6. What opening balance 
should be included in the following period's trial balance for motor vehicles. And I'm not to write up the whole T account, but you had balance brought forward, uh, additions, disposals. We end up calculating a balance at the end of the year of 36,750. And show you one of the most fundamental things of all is having calculated the balance, we always carry it forward to the opposite side. There is the balance at the start of next year. 1st of July X6. A debit of 36.750A. All right, number 14. Which two of the following items must be disclosed in the note to the financial statements for intangible assets? Uh, look at the lecture on intangible assets, goodwill, development, expenditure. Uh, straight from the list. But let's run down the number one. The useful lives of intangible assets capitalised in the financial statements. Yes, that has to be disclosed in the note. Uh, number two, a description of the development projects which have been undertaken during the year. No, you're not required to describe them. Number three, a list of all intangible assets purchased. No, we're not required to list them. Number four, the impairment losses written off intangible assets during the period. Yes, that is required. And so it's not much more I can say this, it's very much just a learning the rules one. But the answer is one and four, the answer is A. Oh dear, and yet another statement one, number 15. Which of the following statements are correct? One, capitalised development expenditure must be amortised, amortised, like depreciated, over a period not exceeding five years. No. You amortise it over uh, the period where you expect it to be earning money. Um, but there's no specific time limit stated. Uh, number two, capitalised development costs are shown in the statement of financial position under the heading of non-current assets. Yes, they're non-current assets. Very often there will be two subheadings, tangible, intangible, but they are non-current assets. Number three, if certain criteria are met, research expenditure must be recognised as an intangible asset. No, never ever. Research expenditure must be written off in the year it's incurred. It's development expenditure that must be capitalised if certain criteria are met. So the answer is two only. It's A.